Hi, my name is Stephen Bauman, and in this tutorial, I'm going to be taking you through the process of making a portrait drawing using sepia chalk. Now, this sepia chalk is a really painterly medium, and by that I mean it really lends itself quite well to working in broad swaths of dark and light value. It offers you the possibility to have deep, rich, and textured shadows, and also softly modulated form within the lights. For those of us who like to render forms quite tightly and specifically, however, it will present a very particular kind of challenge. We need to alter a little bit our sense of rendering spectrum. By that I mean we're essentially going to have to work a little bit more loosely than we're used to. Which actually could be a very good exercise for those of us who are used to getting too deeply involved in the detail in a portrait and kind of missing the big picture. So we could say it's a little bit of a limitation, but I actually think it's a kind of hidden advantage. There's also going to be a couple different kinds of applications of this particular medium. Starting out, of course, I'm using the 5.6 millimeter lead holder and the chalks that I've sharpened to literally get the sepia onto the paper. But then I've also taken the powder that I derived from that sharpening, added that to distilled water, creating what is called an aqueous dispersion, which then I can apply to the paper with a soft sable or synthetic round brush. Because of the qualities of this medium, the buildup of the drawing through its stages was a little bit more fluid than I'm used to. Usually I will like to have a very complex block-in stage that involves a linear wireframe which allows me to render out some of the three-dimensional and proportional properties of the head before I actually get into value. The richness and darkness that comes along with sepia chalk, however, meant that I had to limit my construction lines, as they may have really scarred the paper and left ghosted lines that I didn't want to affect the final expression of the drawing. Something else that I want to prepare you for in this project is that we are going to have to embrace the chaos a little bit. I spoke before about broadening our rendering spectrum, and in a sense, this is what we're talking about. By embracing a little bit the chaos of the material, we can look at it as an asset rather than a problem, which will allow us to actually start to appreciate what this material naturally wants to do. I also want to make sure I go over all the materials that we're going to use. So I have my 5.6 millimeter lead holder that I'm filling with my 5.6 millimeter sepia chalk insert. I'm also using at the end a 2 millimeter lead holder filled with 4H lead from Mitsubishi. I'm using hard erasers and kneaded erasers from Prismacolor, along with my Tombow Mono Zero erasers. Following that, I'm using a titanium white egg tempera from Sennelier and applying that using a soft synthetic round brush from Blick Art Materials. And finally, the paper. This is a Stonehenge paper that is stretched around a one inch deep cradled panel, which gives it a great drum tight flatness that's really pleasing to draw on. So your assignment in this moment is to collect all the materials you're going to need for this project and also to choose an image from the model pack I've provided. After that, make sure you have a nice, calm, well-ordered studio space that has a lot of light directly on your paper. After that, we're ready to make our first marks and begin this process. So with just these two marks on the paper, it might seem like really there's not a lot to talk about just yet in this drawing. So in fact, what I want to talk about right now is not actually the things on this paper. I want to talk about the things in this source image. Starting with, what are the essential points or the essential features of this that I want to figure out right now if I want to get to a place where I have a kind of fully realized block in on this paper? Of primary importance to me at the moment are the proportions. So the top and bottom of the head as I'm going to configure it on the paper are really important, both in terms of just establishing a proportion that begins to look like the model, but also in terms of my consideration of how I'm going to use the space in my composition. Simply arranging the head well on the paper is a big part of setting yourself up for success in the later stages of the drawing. I'm looking to get a really great simplified version of this head on the canvas that I'm working on. In order to do that, I'm going to establish a basic center line conception of the head on the paper, which is to say, if I draw a center line here in the forehead and here in the lower third of the face and bisect that with the brow ridge and the bottom plane of the nose where it meets the front plane of the face and arrange things like the glabella here and also the bottom plane of the nose here along that center line, I'll be able to make a convincing case for the three-dimensional structure of the head that will later occupy the paper. It's simplifications like this that I think lend so much strength to my drawings in the early stage. Long before this eventually starts to look like the model that I'm drawing, I'm going to have a really nice kind of convincing three-dimensional structure to rely upon when searching for that initial sense of accuracy, proportion, and structure. Remember that when studying proportion, and in particular proportion specific to an individual model, we have to be able to see everything expressed together. And by that I mean the top-bottom measurement 
cannot be accurate alone without the left right measurement as well. Your assignment in this moment is to get something onto your paper that represents completely and also simply the model that you're going to be drawing today. Realistically, this shouldn't take you more than 15 to 20 minutes. And you can understand that within that time, your priority is not to be ultimately perfectly accurate, more so it is to set yourself up for accuracy later on in the drawing. Now in this drawing, I've chosen quite an advanced approach, which is to say I'm not holding back at all in developing the values within the drawing at a very early moment. I'm also allowing the composition to grow a little bit outward from the head in somewhat of an intuitive manner. For myself, I feel particularly confident in doing so, frankly, because I've drawn a lot of portraits in my lifetime. And so for a student, it can feel a little bit daunting sometimes to not have the parameters of your portrait laid out beforehand. I think that that's a totally understandable feeling. However, I only got to the place of being comfortable where I am today by experimenting with starting out exactly in this manner. Allow yourself some time in your work to also improvise. It will strengthen both your intuition and your ability to think on your feet. A very important thing to mention when we consider what it is to start out very early in the drawing with a quite liberal application of value is what is the direction of the light source? When we think for a moment about the conceptual sphere and we think about lighting that sphere from a particular direction, let's say in this case, the upper right hand side, we could understand based on that where the highlight would hit the form and thus also where the shadow edge would run across that form. This area here then would essentially be a highlight and would lead us to understand where the general beginning of the gradation of value towards shadow would start. So by identifying the highlight here, I understand that the left hand side of the forehead and the right hand side of the forehead are going to be turning away from that light source and thus getting a little bit darker in relationship to that central, more highlighted plane. We want to do this really all over the face. Identify where the highest key moments of value are within all of the forms of the face and in this way, we can start to determine in what direction the values will turn away from the light source. Your assignment in this moment of your drawing is to make sure that your drawing and the values you're using in it communicate a sense of three-dimensionality, which is to say those planes that are facing most towards the light source are those planes that are lighter, and as the planes turn away from that light source, that they get gradually darker. Now we have arrived at a moment in the drawing where we really kind of filled out the paper and we're understanding in general what the overall shape of the model is going to be as she occupies this central space within the composition. I would say, however, at this moment, very cautiously, we are far away from being accurate by any stretch of the imagination. I mention this because I want you to remember to temper your expectations of accuracy at the early stage of a drawing. It takes really a rather perceptive eye to catch this in the source image. But if we compare this area and this area, for instance, from a value perspective, what we'll see eventually is that this right hand side is just a little bit darker from a value perspective than this left hand side. This is helpful in indicating the form of the muzzle in relationship to the light source. We can also take a look between here and here and notice that this area to the lower right hand side of the mouth is significantly darker than this area here above the mouth and to the left. In a way, it is like there are four quadrants that all face slightly different directions. Your assignment in this moment is to step back from your drawing, squint down when you look at it and identify the large masses of value. In this case, dark values versus masses of much lighter value. 
In your drawing at the moment, these areas will not be full of the rippling detail that's present in our source image. And so I think it requires an extra bit of interpretation and intention in understanding how they should relate to the entire value context. Which is to say, looking at the hair through here, I understand that it's full of many different value variations. However, as a group, all of that hair is significantly darker than the lightest aspects of the lightest planes of the face. And so my translation of that into a drawing is such that I have a space full of darker mid-tone values that relate pretty well to the lightest values of the face. This is the place that I want to get your drawings to in this moment before we proceed into the much more detailed phase of the drawing that we'll enter into later. Coming now to the end of this first phase of the drawing process, we can see a drawing that looks kind of like the model. When I was back at school, we used to say things like, this portrait right now looks like the sister or cousin of the model and not the model herself, which was our way of understanding that really, we're not there yet, we have a lot of progress to make. And so our mentality needed to fit that present state of the drawing. I wanna bring up something that I know that you're going to have some challenges with. Part of it is the open mouth, part of it is the nose, and the eyes as well. In each of these features, as we observe them in our source image, there are a lot of very dark accents and very sharp edges that we could use to describe some of the detail in those areas. However, I want you to look a little bit closer at an edge like this one, or even an edge like this one. In both of these areas, we see edges that are probably the hardest and sharpest that they can be with the materials that I'm using. If we refer back from those edges, into the edges around our features, we'll find that really in maybe only one place, we come to the same kind of unmodulated hardness of an edge. It might not seem like it, but this is really a super important point to bring up. Something that I see over and over and over in students' work, and certainly something that I experienced myself when working, is that we all have a tendency to over accent our drawing too early. What that tends to do is leave you in a place where you are over committed in terms of the edges and boundaries and shapes that you're using. We lose our flexibility and eventually upset the sense of balance and harmony in our drawing overall. So this is me saying unequivocally, hold back on your dark accents and sharp edges, especially in the focal areas of the drawing. We have a long way to go from here and we want to make sure that the choices we're taking right now are not going to make our lives a little bit more difficult later on in the process.